Hello, and welcome to the Selective Mutism Help Home Educational Learning Program podcast. My name is Kelly, and I'll be your host. This podcast aims to give you the help you need to support the person in your life affected by selective mutism. In this episode, I'll be talking about treatment options to help a person overcome their selective mutism. I'll go over the various treatment options available and what worked for our daughter. Let's get started. Welcome to episode two of the Selective Mutism Help Home Educational Learning Program podcast. My name is Kelly, and I'm a parent of a child with selective mutism. Being that I'm a parent and not a medical professional, this podcast is for informational purposes only. For those of you who have done some research on selective mutism, you've probably come across various ways to treat selective mutism. There's cognitive behavior therapy, exposure therapy, play therapy, occupational therapy, therapy with a speech language pathologist, equine therapy. The list could go on and on, and it can be very overwhelming at the beginning to try to figure out what the best route is going to be for your child. So I'll do my best to break them down for you so you have a better understanding of what the different types of treatments are and how they could help the person in your life that has SM. So let's start with cognitive behavior therapy, as this is commonly referred to as the gold standard for treating SM. According to the American Psychological Association, cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, is a psychological treatment that involves changing a person's thinking patterns. Some strategies include using problem-solving skills to cope with difficult situations, learning to develop more confidence, facing fears instead of avoiding them, role-playing, and learning to calm the mind and relax the body. The eventual, eventual goal is that the person receiving CBT will learn to become their own therapist by developing coping skills. So for someone with SM, they may work on understanding where their anxiety comes from and what their anxiety feels like. They may work on self-talk and telling themselves that they can talk to their teacher or their grandparent and to not let fear get in their way. This all sounds pretty good, but please be aware that cognitive behavior therapy really is best for those over the age of seven because at that age, they have more skills for causal reasoning, perspective taking, self-reflection, verbal expression, and memory of their own behavior. When our daughter was first diagnosed at the age of four and a half, we started cognitive behavior therapy, but I feel like it was just a little bit too much for her at that age. So a lot of of the therapy at the beginning was actually changing my behavior and the way I interacted with my daughter in certain situations. As many of you parents out there can probably relate, I unknowingly rescued my daughter. If someone asked her a question and I could see how uncomfortable she was, I would answer for her. She never got practice talking in situations that made her anxious because I talked for her. I wasn't being a bad parent, and because of it, I didn't cause her SM. I was a loving parent and wanted to protect my daughter. So with that being said, if you're a parent, please don't blame yourself. You are doing what comes natural for any parent, and that's protecting their child from harm. But you do have to make some changes, and it may not come naturally. I know it didn't for me. The biggest change was to wait five seconds for my daughter to answer a question from someone. Five seconds may not seem very long, but I'm the type of person that answers questions very quickly, so five seconds to me seemed like forever. So let's practice. Let's say somebody asks me, what's your name? Kelly. That's a long, potentially awkward pause. Think of all the things that you can get done in five seconds, and waiting for your child to answer a question it can be very uncomfortable for you and the person asking. And I honestly don't think I ever made it to five seconds, but I could get to maybe three, which was better than nothing. And the reason we wanna wait is because when you're in an anxious state, the brain may need just a little extra time to process the question and then to select a response to answer. So giving them that time just allows them to come up with the answer that you're looking for or that they need to, to answer with the anxiety lowered. Another change I had to make was saying things to my daughter like, hey, thanks for telling me, or good job using your brave voice. Again, this was another awkward and unnatural way for me to speak at first. But as I 
continue to do it and practice with her, it did become more natural and it gave her the encouragement that she needed in that moment. So if you say it enough times, they'll start saying it to themselves when you aren't there. It will set them on the path towards intrinsic motivation, meaning they start doing brave things because it makes them feel good inside, which is what cognitive behavior therapy is all about. Now you may be thinking, Kelly, it seems like you're only talking about things you had to change in cognitive behavior therapy, but what was it like for your SM daughter? And to be honest, it was really hard for her and it was hard for me to watch her in a situation that was hard. So I could see that she couldn't make eye contact with her therapist. They had a little ball with the alphabet on it that they would roll back and forth. And she had a hard time rolling the ball to the the therapist. She couldn't play the games with the different SM rules we created to get her to communicate during those games because her anxiety was just so high. And I was completely unaware of how bad things really were for her until we started therapy. We went to therapy once a week for 11 weeks. And at the beginning, our psychologist kind of gave us a timeline and that most kids by the sixth week of therapy are able to be separated from the parent and talk easily with a psychologist. But at our 11 week point, our daughter was barely able to get out a whisper and our psychologist didn't really know what else she could do. And she said, well, you have two options here. I've taught you as much as I can when it comes to selective mutism and supporting your daughter. So you could go at it on your own, or you could go to an intensive camp out of state. So this brings me to another type of therapy for SM kids, which is intensive camps. So there are various intensive camps in the U S generally it's a week long classroom a classroom simulated camp. So it gives kids an opportunity to practice speaking in a school-like setting. They practice talking with a teacher, a peer, asking to go to the restroom, share during show and tell, go on field trips, and other opportunities similar to a school day. They are usually paired up with a therapist who works one-on-one with them, giving them the tools they need to help overcome their SM. So while the child is in a class, The parents also attend their own classes to learn how to support their child once the camp is over. Because it's not a one and done situation typically. You have to do follow up at home based on the things you and your child learned at camp. For us, this is, it seemed too intense for our daughter at that time. She needed more practice getting comfortable with the basic things like eye contact, handover, takeover, and nodding her head before just jumping into a camp. For those kids who have those basic communication steps in place, camps may be a really good option for them, and it might give them kind of the little kick they need to help them understand where they can go to the next level in overcoming their SM. I'll post a link in the episode notes of a list of camps here in the U.S. in case there's any close to you. Since a camp wasn't the right option for us at that time, we decided to go with the other option, which was going at it ourselves. As you may have noticed, I'm pretty self-motivated. And when I see a problem, I do everything I can to solve it. So going at it ourselves was the right choice for our family. Exposure therapy was a big part of us going at it ourselves. I'll save I'll save the info about our journey with exposure therapy for another podcast episode as it entails a lot of information. But for now, I'll at least tell you what exposure therapy is. Exposure therapy is a psychological treatment to help people confront their fears or anxieties. So think of it as someone who is afraid of dogs or spiders or snakes. You wouldn't throw them into the dog park or make them hold a tarantula or feed a snake. You would expose them gradually to their fear until they are at a point of overcoming it. You may show them different pictures of a dog, spider, or snake, then watch videos. Then if you're working with the person that is afraid of dogs, you may find a dog walking in the neighborhood and pass it on the opposite side of the street. Then you might pass it on the same side of the street. Then you let the dog sniff your feet, then your hands, then pet the dog. Exposure therapy is about finding that sweet spot in getting the person out of their comfort zone just enough to accomplish a small step. Same goes for an SM child. We would, we would start our daughter with, how hard would it be to, and then name something we wanted to work on. For example, how hard would it be to wave to your friend at school? 
she could say easy, medium, or hard. If it was hard or even easy, we wouldn't even try it. We wanted to go for those medium things where it's just a little bit uncomfortable for her to do, but she can do it. Again, I'll go into more details on specific exposures in an upcoming episode, but if you're eager and want to hear about it sooner, check out day one of the spring 2021 online summit where I have a long discussion about our experience with exposure therapy. So as we went through the CBT route and the exposure therapy route of treatment, I always felt like something was missing. I felt like she needed something else to support her brain and body. So I started looking into occupational therapy or OT. I had a good friend of mine who was an OT. So I asked her a bunch of questions. I also met another mom of a child with SM and she, she explained her experience that her child had an OT. And to be honest, I think I was more confused after I talked to them because it didn't make sense to me on how it actually worked. Then I would read definitions in a Google search about OT and it would say something like a form of therapy for those recuperating from physical or mental illness that encourages rehabilitation through the performance of activities required in daily life. What? That doesn't make any sense. So if you want to hear my aha moment of when I finally understood the definition of occupational therapy, check out day three of the 2021 online summit. Even though I was confused, I still wanted to give it a try. I figured if it didn't work out, it didn't work out, and at least we can say we tried it. But I was truly amazed at what occupational therapy could accomplish. It gave us an inside look as to where our daughter's anxiety was coming from, and she was able to have a ton of fun while connecting brain and body while learning coping mechanisms. We found that our daughter had an underdeveloped vestibular system, Again, this was something that was super confusing to me at first. Basically, the vestibular system lets your body know where you are in space by utilizing different components of the ear and ear canal, among other anatomical and physiological processes that are over my head. Since her system was underdeveloped, she didn't know where her body was in space, and this caused her to have anxiety. If she's sitting at a desk and her feet can't touch the floor, she doesn't know where her feet are. If she spins in a slow circle, her eyes would dart back and forth, trying to figure out where she was. Due to this underdevelopment, she could never sit still. She has to be moving all the time to give her body input so it knows where it is. So I can see how that could cause anxiety. If you don't know how close something is to you or where your your feet are in relation to the floor, that's going to cause anxiety. And for some, that anxiety causes their selective mutism. I was overjoyed with finally understanding where her anxiety was coming from. So once we started OT, we really saw her come out of her shell. We were able to cut her dose of medication in half three months after starting occupational therapy. She was speaking to teachers more, peers at school more, and that's what we were really striving for. I talked to a pair of amazing occupational therapists during the spring 2021 online summit So if you want more in-depth information about OT, especially with kids that have anxiety, definitely check out day three of that summit when I had my talk with Sensational Spaces. It really is a wonderful talk and I learned so much from them. So next I wanted to talk about speech language pathology, which can also be called speech language therapy. This was another area that I was not well educated on and didn't understand the need for it. Our daughter could speak fine. Why would she need a speech language pathologist? Plus, our daughter couldn't speak to anyone outside of about four people, so how is an SLP going to work on speech if she isn't going to speak? Well, then I learned about a part of the language called pragmatics, and this is the part of language that refers to the social language skills that we use when interacting with others. A big component is eye contact, facial expressions, and body language. Plus, it includes what we say and how we say it. Think about it. If a child goes years without practicing conversations with others, like taking turns in a conversation, understanding exaggerations or sarcasm, using the right facial expressions for the topic being discussed, they're going to be lagging in those skills. So that is where an SLP can come in handy for an SM child. But please make sure that the speech language pathologist or therapist are trained in SM prior to starting work with an SM child, or at least have them willing to learn before they start working with an SM child. And sometimes as a parent, 
you may have to become the expert in this and train professionals so they understand that SM is an anxiety disorder and they need to allow the child to warm up and not force them to speak. And this could be difficult for speech language pathologists who their career is based on hearing people speak and helping them with speaking issues. Also, many schools in the U.S. may have an SLP within the school. So if your child's on an IEP, they may qualify to get services within school. The other two types of therapy I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast were play therapy and equine therapy. We did not have any direct experience with these types of therapies, but I have spoken with people who have. So my understanding of play therapy is is just as it sounds. A therapist will follow the child's lead and play how the child wants to play. So this can increase their confidence, can help them learn to play with others. It can help them learn to experience and express emotions, become better problem solvers and other benefits. I think if play therapy can be a place where an SM child's anxiety is lowered, the child may have a better opportunity to communicate. If the therapist understands how to build rapport and remove the expectation to talk, but encourage communication, it could be very beneficial. But on the other hand, if it turns into your child playing by themselves or not playing at all, or if the therapist is expecting too much out of the child too soon, it may not be the best type of therapy. Finally, I had mentioned equine or horse therapy. I recently interviewed Gay James, author of Living Beyond the Silence, about her journey with her son who had SM as a child. She told me about her son doing equine therapy and how it how helpful it was. Although he didn't have to speak to the trainer or the horse, he was still able to show control for something much larger than him, which gave him a new sense of confidence and purpose. She mentioned that the amount of meltdowns and the intensity of meltdowns at home started to decrease and he looked forward to going, which can be hard for an SM child to do things outside their comfort zone. So the fact that he was doing better at home and wanted to go were definitely pluses for her. What I like about equine therapy or being around animals in general is that they don't talk back. They hear what you are saying, but it doesn't really affect them too much. The horse will still go about walking the trail or munching on some hay, whether you're talking or not. Because there's no pressure from the horse, to have the person next to them talk to them. The child's anxiety is lowered, so they may start talking to the horse or the trainer or the other children around. Obviously though, if your child is afraid of horses or large animals, this may not be the right option. But if they show an interest, it could be beneficial. If you wanna hear the full interview with Gay, listen to day one of the spring 2021 summit. Well, that was a lot of information I talked about. I think the main takeaway from this is knowing which treatment is best based on your child. Ask yourself questions like, well, are they a little older and have the potential to understand the concepts used in cognitive behavior therapy? Do they like doing challenges and are motivated by a reward system to use in exposure therapy? Do they have a lot of underlying anxieties that you wanna know where it's coming from? Maybe OT would be a good place to start. Are you looking for a way for your child to interact in a non-anxiety producing environment? Maybe play therapy or equine therapy is right for your child. Whatever you choose, you need to make sure the therapist has an understanding of what selective mutism is. They cannot force the child to speak or you can't have them say something like, I can't help you if you won't talk to me, which was what a counselor told our daughter. Those aren't going to help. It's going to make them less likely to talk to that person. I can tell you that our daughter never spoke to that counselor who said that to her. Another thing I wanted to mention is that there may be more than one therapy that's needed. Maybe a combination of cognitive behavior therapy and occupational therapy will be the best. Or the type of therapy may change as your child progresses. Maybe starting with play therapy then switching to cognitive behavior therapy while doing your own exposure therapy. There's many different options. You may have heard me mention a few times about past online summits during this podcast. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, Twice a year, I host free SM online summits and record interviews with some very amazing professionals from all over the world. And we discuss topics surrounding selective mutism. After the summit is over, the videos are available to purchase, which gives you lifetime access to those videos. Because I want you to have as much information you can at a price that fits in your budget, I'm offering a special discount code just for those listening to this podcast. 
if you use the code podcast two all lowercase letters with the number two after it, you will save 25% off the cost of the days I mentioned, which were days one and day three of the spring 2021 summit. It drops the price from $27 to only $20.25. Not only will you hear about my story of exposure therapy and gay story in day one, you'll also hear from a young woman who grew up with SM and how she came over, overcame it. In day three, you'll hear from the two OTs I had mentioned, plus two other videos, one of which is someone talking about sound therapy and rhythmic movement therapy. And in my opinion, this is an area that really should be incorporated with all SM kids. The other interview in that day is me talking with an SM specialist from Australia, and she tells us how to support a child when they're in that moment of high anxiety, whether you're a parent or a teacher. So you get all those videos for just $20 each for each of the days. For more information on that and other information regarding selective mutism, you can visit www.smhelp.org. Again, the code is PODCAST2 to receive the 25% discount. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. My next episode will be available July 15th, and I'll be talking about a potentially controversial topic, which is the use of medication for an SM child. I'll be sharing our choices and how our thoughts on medicating has changed during the course of our journey. As always, if you have a topic you would like discussed or you have any questions pertaining to selective mutism, you can email me at smhelp2020 at gmail.com or visit www.smhelp.org. Thank you and take care.